If you've spent any time digging through wartime engineering manuals, personal diaries, or field reports from the Second World War, you've probably noticed something strange. There are pages and pages devoted to weapons maintenance, trench construction, and food preservation. Yet almost nothing about one of the most pressing problems soldiers and civilians faced every single day. Staying warm with almost no fuel. This silence isn't accidental. Today's video covers a heating method so efficient, so quietly effective, that it was deliberately sidelined after the war because it conflicted with post-war industry, centralized fuel systems, and modern building norms. This isn't folklore or campfire trivia. It's a practical, documented approach that kept people alive through brutal winters, and once you understand it, you'll never look at heat the same way again. What makes this especially relevant to Iron Age instincts is that this method sits right at the intersection of survival, engineering, and historical truth. It doesn't rely on advanced technology. It relies on understanding airflow, thermal mass, and human behavior under pressure. Stay with me for the next minute, because once this clicks, you'll realize why it vanished from official manuals despite outperforming many modern systems in fuel efficiency. Wartime scarcity you know, really forced both engineers and everyday folks to rethink what heat actually meant. By 1941, fuel shortages were crippling much of Europe. Coal, well, that was being prioritised for the railways and for arms production. Firewood was stripped from forests at an unsustainable pace, leaving many with very few options. Conventional stoves back then wasted most of their heat straight up the chimney. That was fine in peacetime, but it turned out to be disastrous during total war. So engineers working in occupied territories and bomb-damaged cities began to focus less on producing heat and more on trapping and storing it, which was quite a shift in thinking. The solution that eventually emerged was, well, deceptively simple. Ultra-low output fires paired with heavy masonry or earth mass, all designed to absorb heat slowly and release it over many hours. Unlike those roaring stoves that demanded constant feeding, these systems burned small amounts of fuel at very high efficiency. The real goal wasn't to heat the air directly but rather to heat the structure people lived in. So, why did the masonry heat retention system really outperform the standard stoves, you might wonder? Well, the core of this erased heating hack was the masonry heat retention heater itself, sometimes, you know, called a mass heater or a slow-release stove in various scattered references. During the war, variations of it popped up in Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, and parts of Germany, often improvised rather than officially sanctioned. The way it worked was rather clever, actually. A short, intensely hot burn would heat internal channels built into brick, stone, or clay. Exhaust gases were forced to travel a long path through this mass before exiting, which meant they transferred nearly all their heat along the way. What really made this system stand out was its efficiency. A single firing, lasting less than an hour, could keep a room warm for, well, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Soldiers quartered in requisitioned farmhouses noted that these heaters allowed them to burn broken furniture fence posts or even dried roots instead of precious coal. Civilians reported sleeping through freezing nights without tending a fire. 
how airflow control made the difference between warmth and smoke. The real genius lay in airflow management. Traditional stoves relied on strong drafts, which pulled heat away as fast as it was generated. Wartime heaters restricted airflow deliberately, creating a hotter, cleaner burn. Internal baffles slowed exhaust gases, ensuring complete combustion and maximum heat transfer. This also reduced smoke, which was critical during blackouts when visible emissions could attract aerial attention. You know, you can see this principle applied today if you study sealed combustion systems or modern rocket mass heaters. But honestly, the wartime versions were often simpler and a fair bit more robust. So, why did this method quietly disappear after 1945? Well, after the war, rebuilding demanded speed and standardization. Central heating systems powered by coal, oil and later gas fit perfectly into those expanding industrial supply chains. Masonry heaters were frankly labor-intensive to build difficult to retrofit into modern apartments and impossible to monetize at scale. Manuals were rewritten, training programs dropped the old designs, and, well, knowledge retreated into rural communities and family traditions. There was also, you know, a philosophical shift. After the war, architecture started to really emphasize convenience over resilience. Systems that once required folks to understand how heat actually behaved were swapped out for ones that only needed you to fiddle with a thermostat. The old heaters, believe it or not, worked almost too well with very little fuel, which, well, made them a bit economically inconvenient in a world that was all about growth. Now, how can you actually apply this knowledge today in practical ways? This isn't just, you know, some bit of historical trivia. The principles are honestly immediately usable. If you happen to live in a cold climate and rely on wood heat, understanding thermal mass can, quite frankly, radically reduce your fuel consumption. Even without building a full masonry heater, you can, you know, increase efficiency by placing dense materials like brick or stone near a heat source to store warmth. In off-grid or emergency scenarios, a small hot fire combined with mass can actually outperform a large open flame. For those restoring old buildings or cabins, studying wartime heater layouts can, well, inform safer, more efficient retrofits. In a survival context, this approach really teaches a critical lesson. Efficiency beats intensity. Heat retained is more valuable than heat produced. The most important takeaway is not the heater itself, but honestly the mindset behind it. Under extreme pressure, people stopped accepting waste as normal. They questioned assumptions and optimized everything, including warmth. That mindset is what Iron Age Instincts is really about, recovering lost knowledge that modern comfort has made us forget. If you found value in this deep dive, make sure you subscribe to Iron Age Instincts. Share this with fellow history buffs and survival-minded thinkers. And, you know, keep these conversations alive. Some of the most effective knowledge ever developed is only lost if we let it stay buried.